Good afternoon, everyone. I am showing that it is one o'clock sharp, and I know that some of you have other obligations that you need to get to, so we will try to keep this right at an hour today. Just a couple of logistical items. Um, Ginny Laramore is joining us again, and she'll be handling our questions in the same manner that we did before, where you submit those either anonymously to Ginny or just post those into the chat feature of our Zoom meeting. We have some additional security in this Zoom uh, environment that you may have noticed when you logged in, that it asked you for login information. We also have um, another feature that allows us to lock this meeting to additional participants after 10 minutes. So if you're not in the meeting in the first 10 minutes, you'll, you will be locked out. And we will continue to use that security feature uh, for additional Zoom meetings in the future due to the fact that we've had just a few um, issues with security with some of our Zoom environments. With that, I want to um, thank our co-chairs uh, for today from the College of Business and the College of Science and Engineering, um, Scott, um, Scott Snyder, and um, also um, Dean, our, our um, College of Ed um, Dean team, or College of Business Dean team, who are joining us as well. As you may know, we are in the College of Science and Engineering. Um, those of you in Science and Engineering may not know that um, we've been using uh, a group of um, three people to manage the College of Business during the interim while we're waiting uh, for our new Dean, Shane Hunt, to join us. And that will be in just, in just a few weeks from now. So I will turn it over to our co-chairs when we get to that point. For now, I want to just run through quickly what this agenda will look like. We won't have a lot of presentation time. Hopefully this will take about 20 minutes is all. And then we will have a lot of time for questions because I know there are a lot of questions out there, uh, primarily about the fall schedule and about um, how we're handling COVID and any like new updates related to that. I wanted to call your attention, um, if you haven't seen it already, to the letter to the campus that admin council sent regarding confronting hate, racism, and bigotry on our campus and in our country. This has been uh, a really formative time in American history. We talked about that last time when we met, uh, that we were in a historic situation related to the pandemic. And now we are in a historic situation, again, uh, related to uh, civil rights and the consciousness of, around um, repeated violence against African-American communities and others uh, that um, has been uh, really triggered um, by the horrific um, death of George Floyd. So I wanted to just mention for a moment uh, that, uh, call your attention to the letter, but also talk about the fact that higher ed, as uh, we all know, is intended to be an antidote to the kind of hate uh, that uh, certainly that confronted um, George Floyd and others uh, like him, and uh, that are still prevalent in our society. We need to do everything we can to be very strong in condemning those actions but also look at our own processes to ensure that what we are doing in higher ed is providing opportunity, providing the antidote that we know we can be and not um, inadvertently or overtly uh, engaging in, in any kind of hate, racism, or bigotry, or engaging in processes that, that are actual barriers to hope and opportunity. Related to that, uh, we will be using um, new equity measures. Uh, some of you are, are on our accreditation team and also on our program prioritization team, um, also known as health and sustainability at ISU. And those groups will be looking at equity measures that measure how effective we are in terms of our all of our students, 
all of our students, but our student populations in particular, making sure that we have consistency in student progress across student populations. So I just wanted to mention that we would be um, implementing a different uh, way of looking at program success in addition to the metrics that Faculty Senate recently approved. You'll hear a lot more about this as we roll out program prioritization over the next year. But it's really important that we continue to ensure that we don't have barriers in our system that are causing equity gaps. And we know we have equity gaps. We know we have work to do. We know that we don't have as diverse a faculty as we need to have. So we'll be working on these equity measures as we go forward. Darren's working my slides today, so go ahead, Darren. That's gonna lead us to uh, our College of Business update. And I think Neil is, is going to give that for the Dean team in the College of Business. So I will turn it over to him. Hey, Laura, um, I was just getting my sound going. What did you, what, what did you just ask me to do? I just asked you to give the update for the College of Business on just everything on anything you want to share in okay. this um in this video okay so basically um we'll cover more of this today but we're just still working towards a, a plan for fall um plan to be open face to face but right now we're in the mix of trying to figure out where our capacity is for each classroom um and uh we will be in touch with individual instructors about modifying classes as need be um, most of the classrooms to maintain a six, six foot distancing uh, will be, um, you know, 20 to 40 percent of their capacity, depending. Um, and also the uh, university has um, ordered some distance learning equipment called OWLs, and there should be one of those up and running and available for testing. Uh, for those of you that are willing to use the flex model where you see half your students one day and half the students the next. Um, and I believe that testing uh, will be available in room 104 in the rendezvous. Um, but uh, Blake from ITRC will have some more information on that as we get a little closer. So um, that's where we're at as far as fall. Um, so just be tuned uh, to uh, emails from me or Bob. Um, and then also um, we're just um, going to reopen um, next week. Um, the Dean's office has sort of been open uh, but the building should be open and the dean's office should be open full time next week. And then we'll be starting to get our offices open after that. So um, that's where we're at. Is that what you wanted me to cover, Laura? Is there anything I missed? That's great. It's really up to you. Um, yeah. Any updates from the college that you want to cover? Yeah. Um, the, the university buildings as a whole uh, may not actually open until the 29th of June, oh, which okay. is a, a change from what the Rory Mack plan originally said. And that is just due to additional information that we have um, and, and, and changes that are being made to that plan. But we will certainly update the campus as soon as that decision is finalized. That doesn't mean, of course, that you can't come into your own building yeah. in this time period. Thanks, Neil. Thank you, Laura. All right, Scott, do you have updates for the group as well? Yeah, you bet. Um, I, I guess I'd like to start off and just once again give my thanks uh, to all the faculty and staff on uh, this today, and all the faculty and staff in the college and around the university for what you did uh, last semester. It was, it was an incredible undertaking, and I think you served our students very well. It, it has been a challenge for all of us for many reasons which we have in common. From a leadership perspective, and I know Laura shares this feeling, it's challenging because we really want to communicate information as rapidly as possible. And it's really hard, been hard, because there's so much changing environment. As a dean, I want to make sure that my college is, is ultimately prepared, but I also want to make certain that I don't get out ahead of the situation and get out ahead of, of what the university is deciding to do because it's a team sport. And so I, I, you know, I thank you for your forbearance um, on this. 
because the, the information I know can seem slow to come out. And all I can do is, is ask you to trust that we are doing our best and doing our best to give a unified message uh, so that we don't get chaos. And I think today's meeting, when Laura picks back up, will be very helpful for that. Um, the entire university is, is buying a bunch of these OWL devices. I encourage you, if you're not familiar with them, just to go ahead and, and uh, you can do a little uh, internet searching and find out. And there are some interesting sort of, of promos and demos to give you a sense of what we're talking about with these flex models. Um, as you know, and I had a great meeting with the COSY chairs this morning, one of our big concerns in our college is labs and what those labs are gonna look like in the fall. And I think there's still you know, a lot of work uh, to go on that. However, what I have learned is that, that you know, we will need to have plans for social distancing in those labs, but that we are welcome to uh, you know, go ahead and, and, and schedule labs as we see fit. I know, Laura, that my chairs brought up some questions, and I'm sure the faculty on this uh, Zoom will have some questions as well for you, and I've, I've encouraged my chairs to ask them so you'll give us kind of about opening up and, and how things are gonna proceed uh, in a little bit. So Darren, if I could have the next slide. I, I just wanted to take a very brief moment to summarize um, what you all saw earlier. This is a distillation of, of the slides that were released after sort of the intense budget cutting process that, that we had in May. And intense it was. Uh, and I wanted to give you an overview because the slides can be a little bit hard to pick apart. Um, <clears throat> But by aggregating them, I hope this gives you a position. Um, reduction in positions uh, was the biggest um, cut in the COSY budget. Most of those were not filled uh, uh, by people. And so what, what we tried to do when we did this is be very strategic to cut positions that, frankly, we thought we could lose without damaging uh, the long-term positive trajectory of the college and without damaging our programs. Um, uh, se the second very significant cut was in adjuncts and faculty overload. Um, <clears throat> this affects people and I don't want to trivialize it because there are adjuncts who have, who have been with the college for years who may not at least for the time being be, be with us, uh, helping us out and helping our students out. And I regret that and I by no means trivialize the fact that there are human beings on the other end of that rather large number. But again, I did it to protect the integrity of the overall pro programs in the college. Um, reorganization is uh, another one of these proposals. Some of this is the elimination of assistant chairs in some of the, the smaller departments, uh, which will save some stipend money. Part of it's gonna be a conversation that we as a college will start having when everybody returns to campus in the fall, which is about what the appropriate structure within the College of Science and Engineering looks like administratively. We have, uh, very shortly, because this is, we got a lot more other stuff to take care of, and we'll do this in depth in the fall with all of the COSY faculty. Um, we have an awful lot of small departments, and I think it hinders collaboration. So this is a financial move, but it's also a move to streamline both the functioning and the collaborative nature of things happening within the college. Um, operating reductions, we've just taken that out of the COSY operating budget, and that's everything from you know, paper clips to plane trips. Uh, and that gets us to about 5.1%. So with that, I'll thank you again, and um, turn it back over to you, Laura. And Laura, can I just jump in one minute here? I, yeah. I would I would echo what Scott's saying. I would normally have more updates, but we're just kind of right now waiting for some some decisions to be made centrally so that we don't step on anybody's toes. And I commend <clears throat> Laura's office and uh, Blake Beck's committee and everybody that's working so hard to come up with a uh, plan for fall. And then uh, Laura might have mentioned this earlier right at the top, but we did um, change our schedule and we'll be going working Monday and Tuesday of Thanksgiving week and moving finals online. I think everybody's seen that, but I just want to remind everybody that of that. So anyway, thanks. Thanks, Neil. And we will cover 
a lot of that here, hopefully very quickly, so that you can get your questions answered as well. I, do, I wanted to mention uh, or follow up on something Scott said about the OWL cameras. These are, if you're not familiar with them, cameras that allow us to create a different um, online environment in the classroom. Uh, some of you have used these. We are ordering a large number of OWLs for the uh, fall term, and we will be running some training on OWLs in ITRC um, in the coming weeks, and ITRC is, is pulling that training together and is about ready to send out information about it. So they will have that available for all of you if you're interested in learning more about how these work and whether or not you have one in your classroom, it was, it's beneficial to, to learn more about them so that you can use it in the future, if not in the fall. And with that, I want to just give you a quick update on the university budget and where we ended up campus wide. Um, because I think there is, uh, you know, that this was really a monumental effort uh, campus-wide. And as Scott and Neil have both said, it took a lot of leadership and a lot of hard work in the colleges and in the departments to make this happen. It's, it's been difficult. We lost people that we really care about in our community in this process. And I, like Scott, don't want to trivialize the impact of that. Uh, we will miss uh, the people and the positions that have been associated with this budget reduction. It, it is a, a major undertaking to reduce the budget in this way. What it has done though, uh, it is that it has closed our structural budget deficit and that will allow us to have other options going forward. So really, um, kudos are, I think, if that's the appropriate term, due to all of you for your hard work, uh, for your generous spirit in this process, and uh, for sticking with what was really a difficult uh, spring term. And not just because of the budget cuts, and not just because of the distance transition, but because it it is difficult to do all of these things while experiencing the anxiety associated with all of the aspects of the pandemic as well. So just a quick um, overview here, that the total permanent budget savings for the institution as a whole was 11.7 uh, million. Uh, 4.5 of that came from vacant positions and 2.2 from filled positions. The one-time budget savings for FY 2021, that is of course the year beginning in July, um, is 2.7 uh, for salary savings. And um, the employee furlough program will generate about 2 million. I wanna say just a couple of words about that in that I understand that there is uh, some concern about not being able to take those furlough days, depending on how many there are. Um, at your level um, all at one time. The reason that we are not, that we're not allowing that, that we're not allowing you to take all of those for a low days in one term, and we want them split um, throughout the year, um, at half before January and half after, is because we don't know if we're gonna need that entire 2 million amount. As I mentioned, we've closed the structural deficit. That's what the 11.7 of total permanent budget savings did. But the one-time savings are to help us address one-time reductions at the state level and the COVID um, response effort, which is costing the institution, we know, um, probably between three to $5 million. And we have Glenn Nelson, I think, on our call, and he can answer more specific questions about budget. Um, but we don't know how much of that two million uh, we will need next year. So if we don't need half of it, we will not continue with the furloughs, which is why we don't want you to take them all in the first part of the year. Um, next slide. And then I just thought it would be important for you to see what the savings look like by division. So academic affairs here includes all of the colleges and the academic units that are outside of the Division of Health Sciences. The Division of Health Sciences includes those colleges that are inside, of course, the division, 
And then you can see research, athletics, university advancement, et cetera. And then the total amount of savings that came out of those units. For all academic units combined campus-wide, that savings is about 4.8%. Um, Darren's telling me that it's actually our budget officer, Jen, who's on the call in case you have more specific questions about these. And then just to show you what this academic affairs um, roll up looks like, and so that you can see how the colleges contributed to that total 4.8% reduction. Uh, these are the colleges that report um, up to academic affairs, and then the division that also reports to academic affairs is on the next slide. And you can see that breakout here. Uh, totally 4.8%. And of course, the variance um, is due to differences within the colleges about what was available, what was possible, and what um, it was, was they, they were able to do without harming programs. And so there is some variance in the mix here. We did not, at, in the provost's office, we were not prescriptive uh, with the colleges and departments about what would have to constitute these cuts. So we didn't say 20% um, of this or 80% of this has to come from personnel or you can't touch your operating budgets. We gave um, our deans and chairs a pretty wide discretion in terms of, it, in terms of meeting these targets. So that is one of the reasons why we have quite a bit of um, difference in how the targets were met across the campus as a whole. Next slide. So making a quick um, transition here to the fall, and we have a number of plans out there available. As I mentioned, the rebound plan is being revised slightly. We are not actually likely to open buildings until the end of June um, to the public. Um, those buildings are, of course, open to faculty and staff. Some of you have been on rotational work plans already. Those rebound plans have all been uh, submitted and approved through a centralized process, and they almost all look uh, like uh, similar to each other. Uh, they all have rotational work plans, for example. If you have questions about your own work plan, either talk to your dean or to um, your chair. There are four university committees hard at work on planning for fall. And I will just say that this is such a huge effort. I thought moving us to a distance environment in eight days in the spring was big, but in some ways I think this is even bigger because what we're trying to do is balance the safety of our community with the need to provide service to our students. And it, it is a complicated mix because we are trying to make sure that we're taking into account the most recent information about the pandemic and the community spread of COVID while we're making decisions about fall that uh, normally are made months ago, month, months and months ago. We usually know exactly what the fall term looks like right now. And these university committees um, are really tackling a huge um, lift here. One is the instruction committee, and I'll talk more about that group. That's the one that has most bearing on the academic units. There is a community group that's dealing with how we will handle community events and visitors on campus and those types of things. There's an employee committee that's looking at how to manage employee safety uh, broadly, and that includes faculty. And uh, that group is, is tackling things like um, how to handle PPE, um, how to handle face masks in public places in the fall. And then uh, we have a student group as well that's looking at student events, student orientation, the student life experience and how that will be different in the fall, and housing, um, all big lifts there too. Uh, these links will take you to those committees and uh, the chairs of those committees. So you can always reach out to the chairs of those committees if you wanna know what these discussions look like. And a lot of you I know are serving on these committees and I appreciate uh, that hard work and the time commitment that's already gone into that effort. For fall, as Neil mentioned, we are changing the way the fall schedule works. 
it isn't a dramatic change, um, which I think is, is a good thing, but it is it will change the way we handle the fall break. So what we will do is start on time, start on our normal start date, which is early, relatively speaking, for a higher ed as a whole. So we didn't have to move it. It's August 17. We're starting at the same time. We're taking two days out of the fall break, Monday and Tuesday of Thanksgiving break as instructional days, which allows us to get 75 instructional days out of the fall term, even if we end all face-to-face -face instruction by Thanksgiving day and come back for a one week online finals week. So that's what we will do. That information is out and posted and you can find it on this link as well. And I can answer any questions about that um, when we get to the question and answer period. It will mean that there will be an extra week of grading for faculty because we are not changing the deadline for grades or the day that we normally roll grades or the graduation deadline. So those things are all staying the same. We'll still have the same number of weeks in the term, but our finals week will be um, ending a week earlier than normal. Next slide. So I mentioned the instruction working group. This is their um, charge, and it um, essentially is a reset of the fall schedule so that we can ensure that we have appropriate safeguards in the mix. Next slide, Darren. So these are the actions that that group has been tasked with. We are prioritizing first and second year courses for face-to-face -face delivery. That is because we know that our incoming class is very concerned based on survey data in student affairs, very concerned about making sure that they have a face-to-face -face experience. That's why they're coming to college is what they're telling us. This is actually a, a positive. It, it's, it's been stressful to manage, I admit, but it is a, it's a positive. It, it tells us that what we do and the connection that we have with our students and that traditional face-to-face -face environment is what students want. That's what they're telling us. It doesn't mean they want it 100% of the time. And it doesn't mean that we will have it 100% of the time in the fall schedule either. But it's what they're telling us they want and value about um, the higher ed experience. So we're prioritizing those um, first and second year courses. We are implementing social distancing based on six feet of distancing, and that's the, the Centers for Disease Control um, standard. All spaces on campus will be prioritized for instruction. Uh, this means that we will be taking over spaces that have not been instructional for instructional purposes to manage a much larger uh, footprint need than we've had in the past because COVID capacity is what we're calling it is much lower in our classrooms with, with six feet of distancing. And then uh, we are centrally, uh, we're centralizing technology purchases and classroom management of technology. Uh, that is in process. We've already submitted orders. We've cre created a new process for managing technology centrally. And that uh, will significantly improve technology access in most classrooms on campus. Um, not all, there will be some that still will need to be upgraded down the road, but we're making a big um, step forward here. Next slide, Darren. And then, um, and just in terms of logistics, what this committee is tackling is, is huge. They're working, of course, with the registrar's office and with uh, facilities. Facilities has evaluated every classroom on campus. Uh, they were wrapping that up in the last couple of days um, to measure uh, how many students we can fit into all of our spaces with six feet of distancing. We didn't go with a percentage because uh, we wanted the six feet of distancing um, to be consistent with CDC guidelines. And that meant that facilities needed to evaluate every space on campus. They worked really hard to get that done. That has been completed. We're freezing the course schedule 
as you know that it, as many of you know we often have changes to the course schedule all summer long we're changing it for three weeks or freezing it for three weeks while we make all of these big changes room changes moving some courses based on distancing requirements considering large spaces on campus and moving courses to those spaces an example is the ballroom in the student union building which is going to seat 74 that gives you an idea of what these capacity numbers look like a lot of our classrooms that have traditionally seated 30 or 40 are going to be in the 12 to 15 range um, to give you an idea next slide there are a number of instruction um, memos about this uh, posted on the uh, what, there is another one since this one was created uh, posted on the academic affairs website and there's a link here to that so they can um, get more detail about how this is functioning but bottom line um, we are moving a lot of class sections to larger spaces and we will use a lot of high flex um, in the mix which is a class that's half online and half face to face half the co in cohorts so half the class is online on um, Monday and half the class is online on Wednesday and so everyone gets um, an equal amount of face to face and online in that same high flex environment we're expecting that um, high flex environment to apply to a lot of three and four hundred level courses since we're prioritizing um, first and second year courses for face to face. And with that, I'm going to open it up to questions from all of you because I know that there are a lot of questions. And I would just say it's great to see you all. I know that this has been uh, difficult. It's difficult to not to know exactly um, what the fall schedule will look like as well. And so we're gonna do our best to get it done in a three to four week period so that you can know exactly what to expect, exactly what your classes will look like. Um, those of you who are already online, um, we're not changing anything about your sections. Um, we're not changing anything about sections that are thesis or dissertation. We're going to leave it up to you to figure out how to manage social distancing in those one-on-one um, -on -one, um, environments. And so really what you would see is changes to sections that, would ha that have more students in them and are more traditional. Labs, uh, we're relying uh, largely on the units uh, to manage those and to give us um, ideas about what they want to do and whether or not they need an exception that requires a health plan. Those exceptions go to a health committee, and we are anticipating that almost all of our CTE courses would fall into that category, along with a vast majority of the health science programs and a bunch of biology and chemistry and science labs as well. And with that, I'll turn it over to all of you. Hey, great, thank you, Laura. We have a couple of questions related to the adjusted fall schedule. Uh, so we're going to start with those. The first one is, I don't see when our closed week will be, be this fall in the adjusted schedule. Since we can't have quizzes or exams closed week, we need to know when closed week starts so we can plan courses accordingly. And a second part, when will we know what our fall teaching schedule will be? Um, thanks, Jenny. So closed week, we actually eliminated closed week a couple of years ago, and um, that just hasn't been um, very clear because I've been getting a lot of questions about it. So we'll send out something about that, <laughs> but we don't have a closed week anymore. So there is no prohibition um, to uh, quizzes the week before uh, finals week and that uh, went away some time ago. Uh, so that is not an issue. Um, in terms of the other, a question about when will you know your course schedule the course schedule shouldn't change you know unless in working with your chair or your dean um, it changes as a result of changes that you would make anyway we're preserving the course um, load so if you're teaching three courses today you're still going to be teaching three in the fall based on the work that the instruction group is doing it, they just might not be in the same space and so we're trying to preserve time of day as well. But as you can imagine, uh, we have uh, three competing interests here, uh, social distancing, our physical space, and um, a lot of congestion uh, in the course schedule between 9 a.m. and 3 o'clock in the afternoon. 
So there will be some time changes in the mix, but we're trying to minimize those as much as possible. And I anticipate that a lot of that will actually be those face-to-face -face courses in the first and second year that actually have to change time in order to accommodate face-to-face. Now, for those of you who have uh, are in high risk populations, or uh, simply ha or have a family member that's in a high risk population, we are requesting that you remain online, um, and you can work with your chair and your dean to make sure they they know that information as we go forward here with with scheduling. Thanks, Laura. Next question: If emerging circumstances, for example, sudden rise in COVID nineteen infections in this region later in the summer or say that we offer uh, a class at a high rate or a high demand time when other first or second year courses should take priority, would it make it desirable for some of us to voluntarily go from face-to-face -to, -face to online synchronous, i.e. via Zoom? How long into the summer can slash should we wait before making that decision? Oh, we certainly would like to know um, that answer in terms of how the disease is progressing. Um, Right now, we're planning for, as you all know, um, at least a modified, I would call it a modified, face-to-face -face start um, it, in August. If infections are remarkably different, if we're in a situation where we're back in um, a, dist we have to go back to a fully distance environment, we are putting in a mechanism so that we can move all of these uh, courses to distance um, in a, in a easier way than than we had in the spring, although we well in the spring due to all of your efforts. But we are prepared to do that. If we have to go fully um, distance in the fall, we will, we will do it. We're evaluating all the time in the, with the um, local health districts the expansion of COVID. We have a bigger issue, quite frankly, in Meridian than we do in Pocatello. Even now, even now that Pocatello has had a bit of a rise, we still have a, a, a more challenging situation in Meridian. So we expect Meridian to look a little different. I think it will be more online than uh, Pocatello will be, and partly because we just don't have the infrastructure space there as well. So my um, short answer to this is yes. If you feel that you, if your class is a 300, 400 level class, you're comfortable teaching it online. It's not a detriment to, you know, the students in your class, you, you know, are graduating, they, they understand how to handle this. And then um, it makes sense for us to, to know that you're willing to move online. So that's something to um, tell your chair now actually while we're doing this scheduling now because we may have to move some sections online and we would like to know which ones of you are willing to do that okay thanks laura next question there is a lot of concern among our faculty about number one cheating on remote exams and number two students not wearing masks i'm concerned about both of those things too uh, significantly concerned about both of those things we didn't actually see a rise. Um, I, I was surprised, but we didn't see a rise in uh, plagiarism or cheating incidents that were reported through the official channel in the spring. But I suspect that's because most faculty just dealt with some of these issues um, on a case-by-case -case basis and, and probably managed it um, with an F on the assignment and not an F in the course. So we didn't see an increase in, um, in F grades at, for, at the course level uh, due to cheating in the spring. That said, we know we have a greater issue, um, a different kind of issue, I guess, with plagiarism um, with online. And we are, we are doing a number of things to address that. The technology that we're purchasing for the classrooms will help. Uh, we are better equipped now to handle proctoring as well, to handle proctoring for exams. Our proctoring vendors um, nationally were completely overwhelmed in the spring. They just did not have the capacity um, for all of the institutions. And they've really ramped that up. We don't anticipate that being a problem. So if, with professional proctoring um, services, we, we haven't seen uh, the same type of plagiarism issues. So we know that those, pro those proctoring um, services do work. 
and we encourage everybody to work with a professional proctor if that's appropriate for your exam. And um, there are some other safeguards we're working on getting into the system. In terms of masks, we're working um, with student affairs to ensure that we have a safe environment for the faculty. We are ordering masks for all employees. We're working on um, an idea for faculty that would allow faculty to have a face shield in addition to a face mask for teaching purposes because masks are more cumbersome in the classroom. Um, those are being tested. Um, face shields are being tested right now um, by our health group, and we should have a better sense of whether or not they provide protection. And but that is our plan for faculty. And then the student and um, employee groups are collectively working on um, recommendations related to face masks. At the very minimum, um, we know that we will. Um, allow faculty to um, ask a student to leave if they're not wearing a face mask in their class. I mean, that is uh, already um, in the works. So we don't want it to get to that point though. We want um, a process centrally and campus-wide that um, manages compliance um, with mask wearing so that it's not up to you in your class. Uh, but if you, um, are uncomfortable, you can ask a student um, to leave if they're not complying. We are going to do all kinds of things to uh, work on compliance, including um, campaigns uh, related to student, uh, to the students um, posting on classrooms, um, having masks available to visitors on campus, having masks available to students um, if they don't bring it to class, etc so and we're working on all of that but yes those are both significant concerns and i i actually think the mask wearing um will have to be a cultural shift on our campus we'll have to all um ensure that we are compliant so our students are as well and um we will continue to see more information about how that will be that will function in the next couple of weeks from those committees. Um, so our next question, please forgive my cat Oscar, he's new. We got a COVID cat, we picked him up at the shelter. Um, next question is related uh, to the fall semester. How do you see um, the high flex model working in courses offered once per week? So these are like night, you know, three hour block courses that are only offered um, once per week. And we are hoping not to have to have, um, not to have to move a lot of those sections. Some of those are smaller. High flex in those environments would be every other week. And so the students would, they're gonna have less face to face in some ways, but the class meets less, less often. So um, they would meet on Monday, you know, this cohort would meet on face-to-face -face on Monday, and then next Monday, the other a cohort would meet face-to-face. -face. We are seeing, though, for those, those three block um, courses, they, they do tend to be a little bit smaller, so we're hoping that we can uh, manage that uh, effectively enough and that the, the high flex option in those sections allows these students to come every other week and not less than that, which is problematic. We, and problematic in a lot of these high flex classes. Our ideal scenario in the high flex course is 50-50. 50% of the class this day, 50% of the class the next day. But it will require that we move some sections to accommodate the social distancing, even with that 50% reduction. Thanks, Laura. Next question. How will group work be used with the six feet different distances and masks? Communication is going to be very difficult. Could an 1100 level course be made remote with Zoom to facilitate the work group works? Yes. So one of the reasons that HyFlex, I think, has an advantage in this case is that you can do the group work um, remotely and you could actually decide that the whole class was going to re be um, remote that day to accommodate the um, need for group work. And we're going to have to be really flexible on how we handle all of these classroom environments. It is going to be difficult to maintain six feet distancing. 
We know that our students are traditional age students. So students between the ages of 20 and 35 are, are just not as concerned, uh, frankly. Um, I'm li I live with one and you know, keeping him um, in the right frame of mind regarding safety has been challenging. So it, it will be difficult um, to keep students from uh, crossing those six feet barriers. And ideally, I think we will need more chat rooms. I think we will need more online um, to facilitate that group discussion. Now what those students do um, in their own group environment when we are not there, I think we have to um, continue to encourage them to socially distance. But I can envision a situation where students in our residence halls are going to make some choices about how they handle group work when there are no one else is around that, that may not be as socially distanced as, as we want in the classroom. Um, but in the classroom setting, we're going to have to just be really um, conscientious and, and convey that to students. And we're going to rely on student affairs to, to help us with that. Because you know the the safety issues are not going away. Um, the pandemic isn't going away, and and we have we really have to prioritize safety in these environments. So going outside um, for group work, as long as the weather's good, um, is an option as well that can cut down on on risk um, in that scenario. But I am open to. The faculty member having wide discretion on how they handle um, these interactions with students. And, and if you want to move all your group work to online, um, that, that it will be supported as long as you can get the learning outcomes um, to work. Okay, thanks, Laura. Um, you've covered a good bit of this, but if there's anything else that you'd like to add, um, would the university consider requiring the use of facial masks and hand cleaners in addition to the social distancing for laboratory courses, as well as faculty and office staff when in-person interaction is needed? This could significantly reduce the risk of COVID-19 infection. Yes, absolutely. So the answer is yes. Um, in fact, the Roaring Back Plan at the institutional level includes those requirements uh, for all employees uh, and in terms of labs and lab spaces and, and I'm glad that came up because we know that not all of our courses are going to be able to socially distance. I mean, it's just simply not feasible to socially distance. And I'm gonna use two examples that are not in these two colleges, but it's not going to be feasible for our dental hygiene students or our physical therapy students or our occupational therapy students to socially distance in all of their clinical environments. It's just not feasible. So as a result, those course sections are going to have to have an exception to the course distancing. And I anticipate that some of the labs in COSI will have that exception as well. And that involves submitting a health plan that would require um, face masks, that would require some other PPE, depending on what it is that's happening in this section. I mean, our dental hygiene students are, are required to use a lot more PPE than facial masks. Um, and then in some, other, in some cases, other safeguards as well. Temperature checks at the door, for example. Um, that's what we're doing in some CTE sections this summer, is requiring additional health checks uh, for students uh, when they arrive at the lab, because we don't have social distancing in the lab. So those are the kinds of things that we are implementing for those exception cases. Um, go ahead, Scott. Laura, if I could just use my co-host privilege to jump in and ask you a couple of things on that. <clears throat> One of the concerns that I know my chairs were worried about this morning is if we have in-person labs um, in whatever form, what are the consequences for students that don't come to those labs, right? In other words, we may have students that want to stay in Burley and take their everything completely online, but yet we have a lab set up that, that our department or professor feels is really important for the educational outcome. How do we, how do we manage that? So if that, that question is more about um, what happens with if a student says, I'm not comfortable being face to face at all. Correct. Okay. Um, 
we are going to have students in that situation. Uh, we have students in high risk in high risk populations, and they are being encouraged to remain online. We are um, going to have to come up with some options for them. If they're in um, a lab setting, and this is a lab experience that they simply cannot take the risk to be around other people to experience. And then we either need to come up with some way to accommodate that online. Um, there are some testing kits that can be ordered, you know, those kinds of, those kinds of things. Um, or we need to get them into a different section um, for the fall term. And there will be some of that too. Some students may be able to just delay um, some of these course sections. And that's one of the things that we would be encouraging them to do if that's an option for them. With students having, uh, used to having all of Thanksgiving week off and planning trips accordingly, do we expect students to show up on the Monday and Tuesday of Thanksgiving week? We do. And we are communicating that um, directly to students and have already done started already started that campaign so yes absolutely we expect them to be there on monday tuesday those are instructional days um, we are changing the way that we handle that um, scheduling so if you take role if you have normal um, expectations of students we expect those days to count like any other instructional day uh, will there be issues absolutely and that is why we went to a full week of Thanksgiving break is because so many students weren't there on um, Monday and Tuesday. But the, in this case, and they're getting a much longer uh, break after the end of the term. So hopefully that will even it out and students will understand that, that they will be able to leave and not come back for like a month and a half um, after. Uh, the the end of the you know Thanksgiving holiday so hopefully that will mitigate that issue but we do expect those to be normal instructional days. Thanks, Laura. Uh, how is enrollment projected to look compared to last fall? Enrollment right now is um, nationally, and I've been meeting with provosts from around the country. It, it ha there is definitely a national COVID impact on enrollment. And there are a couple of uh, ways that is manifesting itself, and it looks the same for us as it does for everyone in, in these cases. So we're seeing um, students make much later decisions about registration. Uh, students who would no normally register in June are not registered right now. Um, so much later decisions about registration based on just concern. Concern that there won't be face-to-face -face options. Concern that there won't be online options. Yeah, all kinds of things in the mix here. Um, the fact that they lost their job, um, even if it was you know, a part-time job, they feel like they can't afford to go to school. All kinds of things in the mix for students. So late registration. Um, we're also seeing you know, a decline in international students as well, um, nationally, which makes sense because a lot of um, students are afraid to come back into the US frankly and so we're seeing um, a decline there as well that is leading for us to right now we're off about 13 percent in our incoming class uh, compared to or 13 percent uh, on registrations i should say compared to this time last year um, our sister institutions are anywhere are in the same ballpark anywhere from um, you know eight percent down to 20 percent down depending on what population we're talking about um, we actually see a positive trend line over the past um, three to four weeks. It's better. It's been better, slightly better every week. And so we're hoping that continues. Um, and we anticipate that we will be down a bit. But right now, it's very hard to say what that impact will actually be because we're increasing by one to two percentage points um, over last year every week. So... The more information that we get to students, uh, the better in terms of their registration, and we are working really hard to communicate directly with them. So the, the continuing student numbers look better than the incoming new. So it's really that incoming new student cohort that just has not made up its mind to register. So we're working really hard to get them registered. 
and, and I would suggest to COSY faculty, obviously this is an advantage, just if, if you're sitting around the sun and you want to do something and you have a connection with students, drop an, you know, drop them an email, say, hey, how you doing? And I sure hope you're planning to come back. Do you have any questions? And then you can forward the questions to either the dean's office or to student affairs. So just kind of a way to make that personal connection and hopefully encourage a uh, student to come back. Can we do an online course and meet in person for the exam? Um, since we're having an online finals week, uh, you would have to have the you would have to have the on, face to face. If, if this is an online course, it couldn't be coded as online if the final or if any part of it is face to face. So there's that. So um, if you have some kind of face-to-face -face requirement in a course it has to be completed before the online finals week and you'd have to code it as a face-to-face -face course because the message to students has to be that they would be expected to be face-to-face -face for at least some component of that course so hopefully that answers that question we recognize that there will be some exceptions um, to the finals week as well. I know that there are sections that simply cannot get all of the instruction completed because of licensure requirements or um, accreditation requirements or some other um, external uh, pressure. And as a result, we are allowing exceptions um, to the exceptions that would allow a course to have a um, use that week after a finals week for a finals. That exception process will roll out um, here in the next um, couple of months and in time for you to submit exceptions prior to the fall term. We anticipate a number of CTE courses, for example, are going to need exceptions because they're going to need that extra week uh, for instruction. Next question. If students aren't coming back after Thanksgiving, how will winter commencement work? Will ISU still hold a winter commencement? Great question. Uh, that is under review um, as we as we sit here, actually, by the committee that's been tasked with trying to decide what to do about commencement. I mean, they are looking at a number of factors. You know, whether or not it makes sense to have um, a large a large gathering at that time frame, and then um, when it would be. Uh, university, the University of Montana uh, system has moved their commencement to the weekend before um, Thanksgiving. So we see our sister institutions doing some things like that. Um, that is one of the considerations that, that our committee is looking at as well. That decision has not been made. We don't anticipate that that group will make a decision on winter commencement, uh, probably for, mm, I would say, another, at least another several weeks to a month. Thanks, Laura. Next question. Laura, thank you for your for recognizing the importance of a diverse community and campus during these challenging times with COVID and the shift in our country toward recognizing the need to change. Does the university have any plans or processes to get input that is inclusive of those on our campus dealing with issues related to gender, race, and LGBTQ status to better understand the concerns so ISU can focus not only on diversity, the numbers and groups, but inclusion? Yes, absolutely. So we're looking at a number of options to do that. Um, I, student Affairs is, is formulating plans for communicating survey um, surveys to students to try to get student input on these issues. Um, on the faculty side, uh, we are evaluating options, including surveys for all of you, but we will be um, working with Faculty Senate to determine what the best way to get faculty input on diversity and inclusion um, is. It may not be the same kind of survey process. So I would say those are those uh, process, those discussions are in um, process. As you know, we are transitioning our um, chair of faculty senate, and uh, Jerry is from um, the College of Business, so he is perhaps joining us on our call here. Uh, but he and I have had conversations about. Um, not just inclusiveness and in managing, um, you know, how does Senate help manage diversity um, or support diversity uh, campus wide, but how best to do that, um, utilizing uh, the 
the expertise of our faculty, uh, you know, taking into account the expertise of our faculty um, and utilizing that um, to help us um, make the right decisions and in, in regard to diversity as well. So we're gonna be looking at a number of different factors um, and options there. The Program for Instructional Effectiveness, otherwise known as PI, has been housed in the College of Education. It is moving to academic affairs so that we can centrally fund it and centrally support it. And that um, initiative is also looking at supporting diversity efforts um, for our faculty, retention of, of faculty members, all faculty, all new faculty members, um, but also looking at, you know, how are we retaining um, our faculty and where the gaps are. And so you'll hear more from them. Um, Karen Appleby, it continues to direct that initiative. So we will be hearing more from them about those types of issues. If you have ideas, uh, if you have um, things that you want uh, the provost office to support, please just send those to me directly. I'm happy to meet with you as well and have a one-on-one -on -one conversation if that's uh, more helpful. Uh, but I'm open to any ideas you might have that we could support centrally. Hey, Laura. Yes. This is Neil. I, I just want to say that I, I'd be happy to work on some of those uh, diversity things, whatever you need. Uh, let me know because I feel like I've learned a lot in the last couple of weeks. And I went to the Unity Rally last week and the Black Lives Matter la Rally last week. And somehow we've all got to learn each other's perspectives and stuff. So if I can help, let me know. Laura, the Office of Assessment also engages with these issues too as it relates to assessment. So um, we have an interest in that and best practices tell us we need to do those things. So that's another data point for you. Thanks, Neil and Anne. Uh, we are in my office um, thinking about putting together a task force that would look at these issues for student, uh, for faculty, uh, faculty retention, faculty recruiting, and uh, faculty life balance. So Neil and Anne, I will make sure that um, you get reached out to in relationship to that. Um, any of the rest of you interested in um, participating in that type of effort, um, feel free to send me your name um, or send it to your dean's office and they can share it with me as well. Yeah, and I'm I'm really more interested. I mean, I'll help with faculty stuff too, but from a student's perspective, how do okay. we get a more inclusive student community and, and that sort of thing? Anything I can do, just let me know. Thanks, Neil. Hey, um, Laura, we have uh, reached the two o'clock hour, so I'm gonna take these last few questions offline to you and get them back to uh, individually to each of the people that asked them, and then I'll turn this um, ending over to you. Thanks, Jenny. Thanks for your help. So those of, the, those of you we didn't get to your question, um, Jenny will reach out to you with the answer. Um, I will handle those offline. I wanted to thank all of you for joining us. I know many of you, if not most of you, are off contract. So you're working today, and I appreciate that. I know that it's been um, just a lot to manage. Uh, budget cuts, uh, furloughs, and now we are moving um, the class schedule in the fall. So I, I ask, um, I feel like I've asked a huge amount of you. You've all done an amazing job. I hope that um, you all know how appreciated this work is. It is preserving um, opportunity for our students. And so we've been able to continue to to provide opportunity in a time where it, it's been very challenging to do so, uh, thanks to your efforts. I know you're gonna be cursing me um, over the next couple of weeks regarding the fall schedule if you aren't already. Pretty sure Bob Fisher's probably already been cursing me. Um, so if you feel the need to vent um, to my office, um, feel free to do that. It's super frustrating, I know. It's super frustrating not to know. It's super frustrating to see this like change um, happen constantly. Um, it is exhausting. There is no other way to explain it. It's exhausting and frustrating. So I appreciate all of the patience and goodwill you show to each other every day. 
um, and to my office. And if I can be of help in any way, please feel free to reach out, even if it's just to tell me how frustrating it is. Um, and I've said this in other venues as well. Um, Lyle is available to listen to those venting calls too. Um, we both um, are happy to listen to to anything you have to say. So please reach out directly to us and um, we will schedule another town hall, another round of town halls as we get closer to the fall term. Probably in, uh, we're thinking July, um, but those have not been scheduled. But we'll keep you posted. Please continue to look at the Academic Affairs COVID website and the institutional website um, as well for updates regarding boring back plans, updates regarding expectations of when our buildings will open, and um, updates um, from the health district also. Thanks everyone. Please um, take care of yourselves and each other. <laughs>